Hi, everyone, and welcome. It is another great episode of Seek Sustainable Japan. Now, today we are tackling two very important issues in Japan and around the world in terms of a sustainable life, sustainable business, sustainable world. Uh, we are talking about seed saving and the importance of maintaining our food diversity. And we're also talking a little bit about an issue that's not very well known in Japan and even around the world. It's kind of a new topic、uh, PFAS and how it's in our water, in our products. And we have an expert,、uh, Dr. Ryoko Matsuno, who has been studying and practicing and doing these workshops about these topics. So, really excited to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining, Ryoko. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's fabulous to have you. And I was introduced to you. I have to say thank you to the wonderful Wendy, who is one of your neighbors, right? In Nagano. <laughs> so you're based in a rural area of Nagano, is that right? Yeah, yeah that's right.、And、I was brought up in Tokyo, but、um, uh, eight years ago, I decided to move to this area. As it- The, the view of the mountains is so beautiful, and、um, it's just a fantastic place to live. That's wonderful. Now, I met Wendy because、uh, we met online, and she did one of my sustainability、uh, focused courses for tourism.、Mm-hmm. and She said, Oh my gosh, you have to talk to my、mm-hmm. neighbor, Yoko. She is doing so much amazing work.、Uh, so, you're very active doing workshops and activities there in, in the local area, is that right? Well, I try to be. <laughs>、um, but you come from kind of a research background. Tell us a, a little bit about、uh, why you got interested in environmental topics. Where did that、okay. come from?、Uh, I think I was. I love nature ever since I was very little. But、uh, I, after I got my first degree, I started to work for a consumer's organization called Consumer's Union of Japan. And I was responsible for the <laughs> anti detergent campaign. And、uh, when I was working in the area, I, I got some information about、uh, some surfactants. Can, su- some surfactants are endocrine disruptors. And I have never heard about endocrine disruptors before. When I thought, oh, this is very, very important. Cause,、um, well, the, the, the article I first read was about、um, fish、uh, were, were feminized due to some surfactants. And I thought, oh, this is really dangerous. And I thought, oh, I really want to study about it. And、uh, I decided to. Um, do my master's degree in, in the UK. And after I finished my、uh, master's degree, I, thought,、mm, I, and I came back to Japan and I worked as a translator for some years. And I, I so, still thought, oh, I need to study for even more because I, I really wanted to be an expert. <laughs> so I decided to do my PhD in um, um, environmental law. And I studied about endocrine disruptors and then how,、uh, how the environment can be protected by endocrine disruptors. So it, it really came just from kind of a personal interest and then sparked by reading a little bit about it and then、yeah. realizing, hey, wait, what? And I had a very similar、uh, experience. I、mm-hmm. think that's how I got interested. In sustainable tourism and sustainable、right. issues, is once I had kids, right? And I start、yeah. reading labels more and reading more about it and noticing all these issues coming up in the news, which re- before that maybe I wasn't really reading that or interested in that.、Um, but I think that life experience related to what you want to study, what you want to research, and then what you want to start. Telling other people about,、mm. and how come nobody knows about this, right? <laughs> so,、uh, let's let's start a little bit about seed saving. Oh, yes. So, 
uh, I came across a great article about how there is a storage for the world's seeds uh, mm -hmm. a few years ago, and I was really interested in it. And then they were talking about, oh, the dangers of this seed vault um, might right. be thawing out from climate change. So we might lose all this access to the world's thousands and thousands of different kinds of seeds that are stored here. Um, and you're doing seed saving in Japan. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about why seed saving is important and what you're doing. Okay, um, in Japan, self-sufficiency rate of seeds is very low. It's like 10%. That means 90% of you know, seeds uh, farmers use, uh, farmers sow, they come from overseas. COVID. COVID-19 was a serious problem. You know, there was a serious concern about, um, you know, imports of many goods might be stopped. And um, so, you know, seeds, if seeds don't come from abroad, we just, we just, you know, we, we, I mean, Japanese can die from hunger. So um, I think um, saving seeds is very, very important. And, you know, Japanese farmer used to save seeds, but um, I think m nowadays most farmers buy seeds. So if there's no seed, you know, they can't grow anything. So from the, from the perspective of yeah. know, security, I think it's vi vitally important. Yeah, I agree. I just came from a project on the Ogasawara Islands, uh -huh. 24 hour ferry away from Tokyo is the only yeah. way to get there. And I was really saddened that they are living in such a food insecure situation. Now I grew up in Hawaii. Also in Hawaii, we import like 90% of our food. Oh, needs. Right. Uh, some studies say we can only survive a week without imports. Um, so it's so sad to go around Japan and also realize there are communities mm -hmm. in that same situation, not able to grow their own food, or maybe they're able, but the reality over the years, the way of doing business or the way of getting food has changed to make them so self, not self-sufficient and so mm -hmm. reliant on the imported foods. Um, so you noticed that around Japan as well, right? Oh, yeah. 10%. I had no idea. <laughs> That's shocking, isn't it? <laughs> shocking. So, yeah, I was really shocked when I first found out about it. it only 10%. Oh. Yeah. Because if you search online, you do find, like you said, it was a traditional practice yep. to save your seeds, right? Yep. But now most farmers just buy their seeds. I talked with uh, Thomas Klepfer, who's a no-till organic farmer here in Hiroshima, mm -hmm. and he talked about trying to save his own seeds and a little bit about the politics of seeds. And some companies own the copyright of the seeds, yep. and you're yep. not allowed yep. to save your own seeds. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, well, I uh, think a few years ago, maybe two, two three years ago, um, Japanese law changed about, I mean, there was a law called, legislation called, called seed law. And that was, that has changed quite a lot. And then uh, now, you know, there are many variety of plant, uh, plants which are patented. So, you know, if you, I mean, if farmers want to grow the patented variety, they have to buy the plant from the developer. So, um, but you know, what farmers used to do is like, they propagate their own seedlings and seeds. But, um, so, you know, that means, I mean, if, if farmers have to buy, you know, everything, it means they have to spend a lot of money on seedling and seeds. So, you know, you, you know that, you know, farmers, I mean, there are many farmers, farmer, farming doesn't, isn't really 
a profitable um, business, you see. So uh, if um, farmers have to spend a lot of money on, on seed, seed and seedling, that means that is a huge loss to, for them. So um, I think protecting the farmer's right to save seeds and se save seed is very, very important. Absolutely. And we know that so many farmers are really operating on such small margins yeah, of right. profitability. And the number of farmers is on such a steep decline in Japan. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That is very too. So we really need to support the farmers as much as possible yeah. and make it easier for them to yeah. propagate their own crops once they find vegetables or fruit that works well with the land that they're on, right? That makes the most sense. Yeah, but you know, what Japanese government is doing is, you know, complete opposite. You know, they are making the lives of farmers, you know, more and more difficult. Yeah, oh, we got a nice comment from Darren Gould. Thanks for joining from LinkedIn. A lack of seed saving is a global issue due to <laughs> patents, right. Yeah, right? Like operating farms, like companies that have a patent for the kind of plant it, it doesn't seem very logical, right? That no. we want to support people to grow food that we need. We don't want to make it so difficult, but it has become so corporate, like big, big pharma, right? Big oil. We also have big agriculture, uh, which controls monopolies of a lot of our food, right? Wow. Uh, so look at your garden. I love your <laughs> pictures of your garden. It's fantastic. And very similar to the no-till farm uh, that oh, I'm I, I do nearby, right? Farm, yeah. And then uh, the famous uh, no-till farming and natural propagation. Uh, the One Straw Revolution was his book, Fukuoka. right? Masa, Masanobu Fukuoka, I think. Yes, Fukuoka. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, and he had this great vision many years ago about mm -hmm. don't disturb the soil. Uh, you don't need to get rid of all the weeds. And it looks like you're you're doing that kind of method. Is that right? Yes, it's very, very similar. <laughs> I don't put any fertilizer. I just cut weeds and just, you know, lay them there. So. Yeah, gorgeous. And then... <laughs> uh, you also like the last time we were thinking of talking you were doing a seed saving workshop so what do you ah, do no I, it's not me i mean my oh, neighbor okay. do it yeah okay. uh, my neighbors have a, a something called the seed cafe where you know many people gather and they exchange their seeds oh that's which, nice which is very very good because i'm you know if you if you want to save your seeds you have loads like <laughs> a lot so um, basically you can't sell everything so if you can exchange your seeds with someone else who wants your seeds you know it's it works very very well that's a great idea yeah um, and especially if you're doing it in your local area where things are going to grow well yeah uh, you can exchange and say i i had good luck with this maybe in a sunny place or give each other advice or something yeah like. yeah yeah exactly yeah Oh, and fantastic. there's a um, very good group in Yamanashi Prefecture uh, where, um, you know, uh, most most people who take, take part in that group are uh, Yamanashi locals. But I go there because um, the quality of their seed is very good. So, you know, and uh, I grow things which they don't grow. So, you know, exchanging the seed is just just amazing it's really good yeah and i've i've talked to many uh people who are doing organic farming natural yeah. farming uh urban gu garden clinics like mm -hmm. john walsh in tokyo uh people just trying to get people excited about growing their own food uh even if you're doing it on planters on your terrace in the yeah. city right like you can start to grow something uh, that a recent trip i did to ogasawara and I visited a wonderful farm run mm -hmm. by a second generation farmer on uh, Chichijima, mm -hmm. No Safe Farm. And she gave me and other people who attended her garden tours a little berry, coffee berry, which has a coffee seed inside or a bean. 
And wow. she encourages people to go and plant it and try to grow their own coffee tree, you know? Wow, it, that's it, amazing, it's a, isn't it? It's such a nice idea. And you realize all the coffee I'm drinking, that comes from like a hundred coffee trees. Like it really needs a lot of trees to make a one cup of coffee. Oh. And so you're raising awareness, but also you're encouraging people to grow, grow their own plants, mm -hmm. which is lovely. Yeah, I love that idea. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so in your garden, how do you save your own seeds? Do you have a special method? Oh, well, basically, um, seeds needs to be, I mean, fruits needs to be very, very mature. So like, um, okay, when I was talking with a friend, uh, the other day, she said, oh, I saved the seeds of sweet corn. And when I looked at this, I thought, hmm, they are rather soft. I don't think they will, they will germinate. So, you know, you really need to let them mature. Is it, is it best if it's really dry? Yes. Yeah. And, I mean, you really need to let them on the uh, plants. Like in you know, aubergines, they usually eat when they are, you know, this size, maybe. But... Um, let them grow until they become the double the normal size. And, um, and I think, um, I think they, farmers um, call that letting it go to seed. Oh, yes. Right? Oh, yes. That, exactly. makes, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> I exactly. Yeah. That. yeah. That makes sense. And yeah. then on your, your plants as well, it looks like some of them are going to seed. Is that right? Ah! Okay, the, the, the one in the center, they are cucumbers. And um, I, I, they are from my seeds. I, I saved the cucumber seeds like for the last five years or so. Great. And um, I don't think, um, I don't, I, I can't really see any cucumber at all. So maybe they are dying, I don't know. But um, cucumbers need to be like, this uh, okay this size like this so very very big and they i mean you really need to let them go yellow and um when so you leave them on trees like at least for one, one month or something like that and in nagano as it's cold uh, when the frost comes all the summer vegetables will basically die so you really need to calculate you know how long it will, it's gonna take to, you know, that they go they go to seeds. So um, for cucumbers, you need something like two months, maybe not two months, forty five days, something like that. And for a uh, cool jet, you need two months or something like that. So you really need to calculate. Okay, the first first frost could come like middle of October. So you know they have to be. It needs to be germinated by whatever date, something like that. Interesting. Now, I I do compost at my yeah. house, and yep. composting is something everybody should do because it reduces your trash immediately by 30%. Right. You're really helping your community, but yeah, also yeah, it's yeah. great for your garden. And I get lots of compost treasures. <laughs> right. <laughs> right and then so i'll see a little sprout oh yeah on my compass and I'll be like okay good i wonder what that is that might be a tomato it might be a cucumber right so that's another way to reuse your seeds right right right, right. right. and you must do compost because you're doing oh, natural yeah. farming. but actually i don't really use my compost because you know i don't put anything in my field so uh, they are like piling up. I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> you have to dig it in. Keep, keep yeah. digging it in different places, and then you're going to find some treasures that you yeah. can use. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I've had the most delicious tomatoes, uh -huh. which came from compost, oh, or right. the most delicious cucumbers, which came from compost. Uh, so it's it's always nice to it's nice surprise. Oh yeah, right, 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 little right. treasure. 
<laughs> yeah, but the beauty of um, growing, I mean, saving your own seed is like, you know, you know the varieties that you really like. You know, when I lived in Tokyo, I, I just bought tomatoes, you know, whatever variety they are. But now I know, oh, this tomato I really like. So I, I you know, I will just keep, you know, growing this. So there are uh, something like five to six uh, different varieties of tomatoes I really like. So I grow them every year. Nice. And I save the seeds every year. <laughs> That's so nice. And it's so yeah. rare. In Japan, I find most supermarkets, the tomatoes don't have enough flavor. No, no, they don't. If I find a really good tomato, I always try to, even if it's more expensive, I try to buy it. Right. And then I try to keep the seeds and keep reusing it if mm -hmm. possible, right? So that's that's a good style, like you said, your favorite tomatoes. We need more like heirloom, they call it oh, an yeah. heirloom styles, right? Then you get more diversity. Mm -hmm. um, also in Ogasawara, they're famous for tomatoes. Oh yeah. And uh, the local guide we were talking to, she said recently she was talking to the farmer mm -hmm. and there's a lot of tomatoes they can't sell to the supermarket. Oh. Because right. they're ugly, or they're a strange shape, or they're a strange color, but they're perfectly good and healthy. So she and many of the other locals are starting to get the ones he can't sell, mm -hmm. and they're using it for sauces and All juices. Right. And they really appreciate it. And the, the farmer really appreciates it because oh. he's not just putting it in compost, right? Somebody can enjoy it. Yeah. So it's like a win-win. I love yeah, that. Taste-wise, it doesn't really matter, does it? Because you know, if, if even though it's uh, funny shaped, you know, once you cooked, once they are cooked, you know, it's the same. <laughs> Amazing, and it's one of their few local products that they can, they right. can get, right? Um, but that idea that supermarkets won't buy mm. even organic vegetables is difficult to sell to the main shops, right? Yeah. And so a lot of organic farmers have to do direct. Yeah, 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 yeah. PSAs, right? I think it's a lot of work because you know, pack you know, harvesting the vegetables, then pack them, and you know, put it to, to the um, um, Korea companies. It's it takes a lot of time. Yeah. So if you, they can sell them direct, I think it's so much easier for them. And then they can have a little bit better margin as well. I hope. Um, and it's fun to get strange vegetables. I love it, right? <laughs> like you get a really weird shape and it's like art. You're like, oh, right. this kind of looks like a statue or something, like a donut, <laughs> some of them, or, you know, like a oh, well, sometimes they're a bit difficult to cook. I mean, like when you need to, I mean, particularly with root vegetables, you have to, you know, remove the, the uh, soil and the stuff. So uh, sometimes I get, you know, I have funny shaped daikon or funny shaped carrots and it's like, ah. Uh. <laughs> How do you use it, right? Oh, yeah. I, I just peel the peel off and peel, peel the skin off and just just cook. <laughs> yeah, but if I'm getting organic vegetables, I don't mm -hmm. worry so much about the dirt being on a little mm -hmm. bit, like on the peel mm -hmm. of the potato yeah, or something. Yeah, right. I'll but eat it. I'll, you watch it. Like, you I'll eat it, like... but I know it's organic, so it doesn't bother me, right? But you know, if you have sand in your mouth, you, you won't be happy. So you really want to well, get no, rid of it, right? Wash the sand off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's switch topics a little bit. Uh, let's talk about PFAS. All right. Now, I recently saw, and I know this movie came out years ago, but I only recently heard a great podcast with Mark Ruffalo, the actor. Yeah. And he's also a very popular, well, very kind of well-known environmental activist as well as an actor. And he played the role of this lawyer yeah. uh, in America who was a corporate lawyer and then mm -hmm. changed to become an environmental lawyer yeah, yeah. and representing people who were being uh, basically poisoned. And it started with a farmer who was losing all of his cows and the nearby chemical uh, factory, which was poisoning the water that they were yeah. drinking. And then the lawyer realizes it's not just the animals, it's the people. Yes. And he went on to represent tens of thousands of people, and he's still fighting yep. even now. So you are st you have studied environmental law. Where is Japan in this? Is Japan in a similar situation? 
Well, I think in the last few years, people are finding out that um, water in this country is badly polluted with PFAS, particularly near um, US Army base or Navy base or whatever. And um, it's, I think it's very, very serious problem. And um, there's a factory. Oh, is it okay to mention the name of the company? Yeah. Dupont. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Dupont has a factory in Shizuoka Prefecture. And uh, it was recently found out that um, the water nearby the factory is badly polluted with PFAS. And the workers there, uh, when the, the level of PFAS in their blood was tested, they had, their, their blood was also very badly contaminated. Oh my gosh, that's, it's so sad. And it's, it's just, I'm very focused on sustainability and environmental yeah, yeah. issues. And wh why didn't I know about it before? You know, it just, it doesn't get much news, but mm. Japan Times did a really good article mm -hmm. about it uh, last year. Okay. About how Japan is slowly waking up right. um, to the PFAS issue. And uh -huh. they were covering from the U.S. bases in Okinawa right. uh, through the foam. So a lot of the most obvious issues, I think, have come from the firefighter foam. Yes, yes, yes. You're which right. also has PFAS <laughs> and it was leaking into the water systems yeah. um, for the surrounding community. And there are uh, many parking space, spaces, like, you know, big um, building where, you know, which was specifically designed for parking. They also have uh, PFAS as a firefighting form. And I think it was in Okinawa again, that um, one of them broke and, um, you know, there were foam everywhere. It was horrible. I think you can see the the image of that in the Japan Times article down yeah, below yeah, as well. Yeah. And yeah. and then saying, you know, the firefighters went to collect it in buckets. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh no, like that, <laughs> that's not difficult. safe for the firefighters either. Uh, there is one of the cases that Billet, who's the lawyer in the movie for Dark Waters, one of the recent cases he started, well, 2018, mm -hmm is representing a firefighter who oh. got cancer after 40 plus years as a firefighter working with the oh, foam. Yeah. Um, but it's not, it's not just the foam, right? Yeah. It's in a lot of products that we are using all the time. Uh, so this image here from uswatersystems.com uh, shows, of course, the fire safety, uh, fire anti-fire foam, but also mm -hmm. It's in anything stain resistant, any like non-stick pens, oh, yeah. uh, waterproof clothing, mm -hmm. even candy wrappers and food wrappers. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. So it's, it's re and dental floss. So I looked at my dental floss and this is the big hurdle. Now that you know about PFAS, how do you find out if your product has it in it? Is it on labels? No. So oh. they really need to be labeled, I think. You know, whether or not they contain PFAS, you know, it should be clearly labeled. Otherwise, consumers don't know. No. Absolutely. Labeling is very, very important for, you know, any product, I think, you know. Absolutely. That's step number one. Yep. Public disclosure, a uh, yes. uh, requirement of companies to disclose which products have PFAS, and then people can choose, make a, yeah, a yeah, knowledgeable yeah, choice. Yeah. Of course, I think it should be banned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if it's not safe, you can not use it, right? We know it's dangerous, but the first step before that happens, because that's gonna be really slow, is to put it on the labels. Um, now, this really powerful uh, quote from Billet, the lawyer mm -hmm. in the US, and he was quoted in Time, this awesome Time uh, article about the issue. And he said, what we're hearing once again from these companies that put those chemicals out there 
knowing that they would get into the environment and into mm. our blood is that there's insufficient evidence to show that they present risks to humans who are exposed. But these companies are going to sit back and say, we're entitled to use you as guinea pigs. Oh my <laughs> gosh, that's so powerful, right? Is that, I mean, it's like profit over people, profit yeah, yeah, over right. the yeah. planet. We're hearing this again and again, but enough is enough, right? Where is yeah. the regulation? Did you Yeah, study? I read the yeah. uh, Bill's book and, oh, you know, I mean, the film was very good as well, but you know, the, the, the original book was just, oh, extraordinary. I was like, you know, what DuPont and 3M did, it's like, oh, it's a real crime. So I think your what you said in uh, our notes back and forth before we started is, it's really hard to tackle what's in the water, the water mm -hmm. system, that's really hard. Um, but what we can do is start avoiding products which yeah. have it in. Yeah. Right. So you really need to be aware, you know, what what PFAS are, and you know what what sort of products can contain them. And then, um, you know, having that awareness can you know protect you from from you know nasty chemical. I think. Yeah. So it's now really important to you know collect the information and the radio awareness in order to protect yourself and your family. Now the the Japan Times article mm -hmm. uh, said that in 2020 the Japanese government made safety limit for drinking water. Oh yeah, but it's not legally binding, so it's just well. a suggestion. And it's 50 nanogram per liter, which is far, I mean, far less strict compared with, you know, European countries and the US, I think. Now you're researching the topic now, so you, yeah. you don't have all the data yet. You're just starting to do this, but mm -hmm. is, are you coming across any resistance or any legally binding things that are going to come into effect to protect uh recently i think it was last last week or two two weeks ago something like that and japanese um food semi food safety commission uh set a new standard for food you know if they can't i mean food can't contain more than uh, no no sorry uh tolerable daily intake they said you know each person shouldn't have more than 20 nanogram per kilo per kilogram of weight per day but 20 nanogram which is i mean in comparison with uh, european standard that is not strict enough so the the level needs to be a lot stricter what yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. what is the european standard what is it's 0 0.6 six three nanograms so which japanese standards is like more than 200 times looser something oh like that so yeah. it's like oh god oh so and, uh, you know ja i mean in japan i mean internationally uh two uh no three um pfas which are p4 p4 and the pfhx they were banned and in Japan, P4 and P4, they are, I mean, import and manufacture is, they are banned, but use is still allowed. That's the reason why, you know, firefighting forms are still, you know, you, you, sometimes used in this country. And then um, PFHXS, which will be legislated, I mean, the ban of the PFHXS will be legislated this year. Well, I mean, that's gonna happen quite soon, I think. But and in order to use semi, in order to produce, manufacture semiconductors, PFHX is, looks like it's very necessary. And now Japanese government is trying to increase the, the um, number of semiconductors produced in this country. And eh? they are trying to increase the number of semiconductors, increase, increasing. So um, it's like, 
where are we going to go? You know, what's going to happen to this PFHXS, which are necessary for the manufacture of semiconductors? So I'm very, very worried. And I think um, now there's a big factory in Hokkaido. And I think the name of the company is Lapida or something like that. And they are starting manufacturing um, semiconductors pretty soon. And the local people living in the area are very, very concerned about the effluent. So I really don't know what, you know, which direction Japanese government is going. Oh, I'm very, well, very concerned. It doesn't make sense not to regulate it because no. one of one of the big issues you see is it's not only the customers using the products, it's not only the surrounding area that suffers from pollution, it's the workers who get sick from being around the processing, the making of the products. And that was a big part of the story in the movie and uh, what yeah, yeah, the lawyer yeah. in America is fighting for. And we're having a labor crunch in Japan, we need more workers, not sick workers. If you have sick workers, that's not good for your business. That's not yeah. good for the economy, right? Yeah. So yeah, we need. Yeah, the company said that you know they will collect all the PFAS from the effluents, but I I don't know whether that is, you know, possible. possible. <laughs> yeah, I I did come across uh, some uh, companies in America which are starting to advertise ways to treat PFAS water. To these are water treatment companies. Mm -hmm. um, so there's different ideas out there. There are people trying to take it out of the water system. I know that one of the uh, parts of the suit in America was to add filters right. to what they're making. Is there anything like that happening in Japan? Is anybody trying to take it out or research it or add a filter or something? Well, as a matter of fact, I think that was in Okayama Prefecture, and some company which use uh, charcoal to you know, filter the PFAS, they put it near the uh, water source. I mean, they dumped the, the uh, uh, PFAS contaminated charcoal near the water source, and the water source was contaminated really badly contaminated and people who are drinking the water their blood is also contaminated so you know i mean using charcoals or whatever other things that, that, that's fine but you know what's gonna what we're we gonna do about them after using them is a big problem because you know people are forever chemical you see they don't get decomposed isn't that amazing i mean forever chemical means it's going to be in your blood forever. And not just your blood, it can pass to your children. children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And forever chemical also means forever in the environment. Right. So that's well, um, amazing. Some papers say that, you know, they get discharged eventually, but it's going to take six or seven years, five or six years, I think. So, um, you know, uh, if you're in, if you're drinking water by, by drinking water, eating food, if you're you know taking more PFAS, even though some PFAS get discharged from your body, you know, if, as long as there's constant source of coming in, you know, you can't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah, it just builds up in your body. Yeah, and we it's we really have so scary, many so many environmental factors to worry about now we have microplastics we can't see oh, yeah yeah we've got chemicals from foods that we can't see uh this is another but what you said earlier uh really struck out to me for every sustainable issue that we have we're making things we're making products we're doing strategies but without thinking what happens at the end of using this process. Like we still don't have a way to process nuclear waste. No. So, okay, nuclear power, it's clean <laughs> while you're making it, but we still don't know what to do with the waste. Yeah, so is right. it a viable solution? Mm -hmm. Can we make plans just on maybe we can figure it out in the future? 
that's not good enough, right? Oh, well, so you know, we really need to be careful about the, what we buy. Like, you know, if you look, eat eat um, some fast food, which could be wrapped with, you know, PFAS coated paper, you put the, the paper in the bin and the bin, I mean, the paper will eventually end up in the municipal incineration plant and they get, they get incinerated and they come back to the air. So, you know, you really need to think of the whole life cycle of the, you know, all products, I think. Yeah, the circular, circular. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I recently did an interview with Unpacking Japan. And one of the things uh, I talked about is a lot of international visitors to Japan, they're really shocked by the overuse of plastic packaging. Right. And, and it's something that because it's so normal mm. in other countries not to do that, when they come, they're like, oh, I feel uncomfortable. What's happening, right? But a lot of the comments from Japanese people are saying, oh, but we incinerate all of our trash. It's fine. It's all sorted. It's not a problem. But without thinking, even incineration, you're putting things in the air. Yeah. What happens to the ash after it goes right. to landfill? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then that's going in our ground, right? So you really, it's, it's not the normal way to think about things. But... We need to start, right? And I think Japanese people need to be more aware that um, plastics themselves are actually toxic to you. You know, they are really bad for you. You know, some, most many of them are, have uh, endocrine disrupting effects. So, I mean, trying to avoid plastic as much as you can is just not good for the environment, but for good for yourself. You know, I think people, I mean, so Japanese people, many Japanese people kept in ignorance. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not talked about in the media. No. It's not talked about in the newspapers. Right, no. So yeah, how, right. we can't really blame people for not knowing if there's not yeah, available yeah, information, yeah, right? Yeah. But I really think you know, this information needs to be taught in schools. Yeah. Mm. But when your school is sponsored by a chemical company or, <laughs> <laughs> or your research for the university students is, is sponsored by someone who's not going to like what you're talking about, right? So it's, that's, that's also we need yeah public education that is not biased is very important too. Yeah, you're yeah. right, yeah. Oh, it's a big issue. Yeah. Uh, but Yoko, I really appreciate you coming and talking about uh, these issues. Uh, so we talked a little bit about uh, some of the filter ideas that are happening mm -hmm. by water companies. Now, I was surprised to see this. This is from a park in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a sign saying, don't eat the fish, uh, avoid the foam, but you can swim in it. Uh, just wash off after. If you catch a fish, just release. And I'm wondering, once we start having labels, this might start happening in Japan. So is it is it safe to swim in it? Just wash it off after? I was, I was quite surprised to see this in America. Wow, where did you pass? where did you see it? So this is, I'll, I'll add the link, um, but these are signs okay. that people are starting to see. This is from uh, Detroit Free. Oh, wow. Really? As well. Don't eat the fish. Um, if your pet gets wet, rinse off your pet. Um, you can catch the fish, but release it. Don't eat it. Um, so these, yeah, I'll share with you as well as the audience. This is quite surprising, right? Yeah. You know, Japanese eat a lot of fish. And fish could be major source of, oh, hang on a minute. Well, it connects to historically to one of the biggest cases in Japan about uh, poisoning from the fish and food you eat, Minamata, right? Mm, 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 mm. For the anybody who doesn't know about Minamata, can you summarize a little bit the case? Oh, okay. Um, well, I think it was post-war thing, and um, and. 
fishermen in Minamata Bay area, uh, as they ate a lot of fish, fish contaminated with uh, organic mercury. Um, the, the, the organic mercury built up in the body of the, the people who ate the fish. And they got um, pa paralysis or you know, many horrible symptoms but due to um, mercury poisoning. And um, there was a, I mean, there were many um, court cases and uh, some of them are still ongoing. So it's not really finished. The first case finished in 1968 when I was born or something like that. But, uh, you know, there are many, many court cases still ongoing. So it's really, really sad. And, uh, and uh, before the Minamata disease, um, many people believe that um, when, you know, women are pregnant, the... Um, um, Mercury? Oh, is it mercury? No, not mercury. Um, womb can protect um, babies from all toxic substances, but you know, um, uh, mercury poisoned mothers, and they they passed mercury into their babies as well. So babies were born with Minamata disease. So before that, you know. People believe that, and many even scientists believe that. You know, um, oh God, what's the word? <laughs> Fetus could be protected, you know, from all all nasty chemicals. But Minamata disease proved that. Oh, that's not the case. And now we're seeing similarities with PFAS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How yeah. PFAS is passed on to the child, uh, passes through breast milk as well, right? Um, so history repeats itself if we don't have stricter regulations yeah, and yeah, yeah. and more awareness so yeah. i i really appreciate that you're researching and trying to share this information it's hard but it's really important right yeah it's very very hard <laughs> very hard yeah uh, we had a, a great comment from michael mueller uh mm -hmm. on youtube what about gly oh, glyphosate oh dear. Glyphosate <laughs> round up glyphosate. That is a main ingredient of Roundup um, herbicide. Yeah, which is common in Japan, right? You see it sold easily at stores. It's banned in Europe in many countries. Uh, not, yet. not yet. Not yet. Yeah, but in America, they are. I mean, they are not. Uh, they are not sold in, uh, you know, places like supermarkets or some, uh, something like that. So you really need to be a. Uh, go to some specific place like you know like uh, uh, shops which are licensed to sell um pesticides and herbicides i think but you know in this country you can buy it anywhere you know yeah i i have a friend who's an organic farmer and he mm. has a neighbor who puts roundup next to his organic farm oh and no now, now he can't use a big area of his farm because of that. It's it's just awful. Um, but a lot of people don't know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's back to the last. Because lack it, they are advertised as safe product. You see, so labels so and awareness. I, well, isn't it isn't it crazy though that we regulate uh, alcohol, we regulate marijuana. We regulate uh, lots of things, tobacco, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but compared to chemicals, forever chemicals, those seem really minor in how they damage society, damage our bodies, damage the environment, right? Well, actually, glyphosate was sprayed in schoolyard in, the, in, my, can, in my town. So um, I stopped it when I was a town councillor. How how did you stop it? You just raised awareness and voted. Got oh, I, vote I asked the um, the commission of education, and uh, you know, oh, it, I mean, you know, they are they are actually um, carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. 
So you know, please don't put you know spray any carcinogenic um, substance in the school schoolyard, and they they understood. Very good. Yeah, we stop people from smoking around kids. Let's uh, let's protect them in other ways too, right? <laughs> And now going back to another comment uh, Michael mm -hmm. also made, he was talking about saving seeds, oh, yeah. uh, coriander. Oh, yeah. Coriander can yield thousands of seeds. Nature is truly bountiful. I have so many coriander seeds for next season and enough to grind up and sprinkle on my porridge. I've never had coriander porridge. I'm going to have to try <laughs> that. <laughs> I don't know how does that? <laughs> That sounds very interesting. That sounds really nice. Yeah, I eat <laughs> porridge every morning. Oats are a very sustainable product. Uh, even if you're importing oats, um, have I oat milk oats. instead of cow's milk, right? It's a great, great alternative. So coriander, I'm going to try that. Wow. <laughs> are there any, let's get back to seed saving a little bit. I think oh, yeah. we've, we've talked a fair bit about PFAS, um, about which plants you find easy or not so difficult to save seeds can you give us tomatoes. some recommendations hmm? tomatoes tomatoes yeah definitely because well you, you need to wait until they get quite mature but um they are very very easy you know you just you know scrape off the seeds i mean with your know, jelly thing and put in a jar and leave it for two days or something, then the, the jelly stuff will can kind of get dissolved. So you just rinse off and um, dry them. And that's it. That's great. Yeah. Also, um, organic farmers, uh, Heather Nakase in Nagano, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. does na Nagano that. naturally, yeah. yeah. Uh, her and Thomas, who I talked about before, they both talk about using sun chokes. Uh, Jerusalem artichoke or sunchokes. Okay. I don't know the Japanese name, but I often get it when I get their farm produce. And you can roast it just like potatoes. You can make soup from it. So it's great to eat. But if they don't pull all of the roots out, the roots grow again and again, and it's really good for the soil. So plants like that really help the soil, good to eat, but also easy to propagate, right? Every year, we want more plants like that. That's great. And a really pretty yellow flower. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, they're called kikuimo in Japanese. Kikuimo, okay, yeah. okay. That's I great. have loads in my back garden. Right? <laughs> they grow too well, actually. <laughs> it's like, you know, they double every year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I would love, I would love to see that in my garden. I put it in compost. I haven't seen any yellow flowers yet. Oh really? I I hope someday to get the the treasures, the compost. Yeah, treasures be careful coming. because they are very very strong plants. Oh, really? you know, once you put put you know if you put one 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 um there's some artichoke in, in the soil, they will like you know, double in. <laughs> in, in terms of volume every year so you please be careful okay it's okay but bad. i keep thinking but if something bad happens in the world my family can survive just <laughs> eating <laughs> jerusalem artichoke yeah, you're so right. it's okay <laughs> uh, we had a comment from bayside farm thanks yep. for joining jerusalem artichoke is kikuimo thank you so oh, yeah, much. Yeah. yeah awesome oh peanuts Peanuts are also easy to get, uh, germinate, to get seeds. That's good advice. Have you ever tried peanuts? I grew some yes, last year. I love peanut butter. As a vegetarian well, yeah, vegan, peanut butter is our staple food. Right? Oh, I'm we vegan carry too, it so, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> but most of the peanuts is imported. Oh, yeah. Mainly from China, I think. So we need to grow more of our staple foods, the plant-based proteins, the beans, and the nuts. We need them, yep, right? Yep, yep. So but also- it's quite in, difficult to grow for me. I mean, you know, every soil has preferences, like, you know, some soils are good at, you know, growing this or, you know. And in my field, I mean, last year it was, I mean, last year it was you know, due to bad, drought i mean everything was so difficult but yeah 
And then uh, I visited Wendy and Rodrigo, also in Nagano. They run a yep. guest house there. And he is from Mexico originally, and he's oh, yeah. growing beautiful Mexican pinto beans that he Ooh. makes Mexican food from. So having a, a nice bean in Japan is really rare too, right? Well, but in Japan, there are many um, different varieties of local beans, I think. Oh, good. I, yeah. I always buy local beans if I can. Oh, Aziki yeah. beans, right? Uh, uh, soybeans, sometimes mm -hmm. you can see salt, yeah. But, you know, just talking about soybeans, the, the variety in this country is just amazing. Is I it? don't know how, how, you know, how many different varieties there are, but, you know, even in just Nagano area, I think there must be quite a lot. I have never counted them, so I don't know. <laughs> But I mean, are, I'm a big uh, fan of beans because we need that plant protein, right, to keep yep. going. <laughs> I want to make uh, burgers, vegan burgers with locally uh -huh. grown soybeans or locally right, right, grown right, beans. Right. That would be awesome. <laughs> All right. We just have a couple more minutes. Uh, Ryoko, is there anything we didn't talk about that you'd like to talk about? Uh -huh. What do you have? coming up so you're starting to research more about PFAS anything else you've got coming up you're always so busy are you still on the government are you still a government official no I'm not I'm, I'm working on my own uh, okay if I can get funding somewhere uh, there's, there's a um, film about glyphosate and I really, I've been wondering, you know, if, if so, someone would give me funding to um, produce Japanese version of it. I want to put, you know, Japanese subtitle to it because, you know, so many people are ignorant about glyphosate and I'm very, very concerned. The, the amount of glyphosate being used in this country is just astronomical. So I'm like, oh, you know, how could I stop this? So I'm just keeping my fingers crossed so that, you know, somebody will give money to, to, you know, produce Japanese version of the film. I have an idea. Uh, well, Patagonia is oh, yeah? often offering scholarships or funding for oh, projects really? just like that. Really? And a lot of Patagonias, even in Japan, they want to show films like that. So <laughs> let's get in touch with Patagonia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been trying that. Thank you very much. Yeah, and if that doesn't work, um, maybe set up a crowdfunding page. Oh, yeah. Start funding you, because that's a great project. Mm. Very important. And I think those kind of that kind of film where it really has a big impact and it's very truthful but very honest about what's happening, yeah. I think it's it's so powerful. We need more of that, right? Yeah, the, the story is about a um, uh, worker who has been spraying herbicide for many years and they got he got cancer and I I'm not sure whether he's he's still alive or not but um you know he had very bad skin well, but he just the cancer also affected his skin and it was just so horrible and so oh this is something Japanese people need to watch but unfortunately, there's only English version available, so I really yeah. want to put Japanese title to it. Absolutely, we need a Japanese uh, subtitled version to help spread awareness. It's yeah, so yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, well, thank, thank you very much for the yeah, Patagonia. That that that's quite hopeful, isn't it? Yes, yes, yeah. because. I often uh, go to Patagonia shop and I'm so impressed by all the great films that they show, like they have public viewings. And in Japan, they always have ones with subtitles. So that would be a great project. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, Thank Patagonia, you. if you're listening, please reach out to Ryoko <laughs> and give her some funding. Please! <laughs> Well, thank you, Ryoko, so much. Dr. Ryoko Matsuno, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for all the work that you do in raising awareness, in research, but also in legislation and being a counselor and doing the legal hardships as well. I really appreciate all the work you do. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm really, it was a great pleasure to be here. <laughs>
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you everybody for joining and your wonderful comments and questions today. And a reminder, of course, if you have any more questions and comments and you're watching it on replay, please write them below and we will try to get back to you uh, with the answers as soon as we can. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Dioko. Bye. Bye. Streaming in, bird song in my ear, shadow.